Hi. How are you? Very good. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Maddie. Yeah. Um, thanks, for having, uh, thanks for being there again. So I, I'll invite you to share your slides. And uh, yeah, your talk last year was really appreciated by Art, and this, this is why we, we invited you again. Uh, yeah, and now this year, uh, what makes a great open banking API? Uh, thank you, Chris. The stage is yours for 25 minutes. Thank you very much, Mehdi. So hi, everyone. Um, hope you can all hear me OK. Hope, hope everyone's safe and well. Um, my name's Chris Michael. As, as Mehdi said, I, I, I have actually two hats. So for the last uh, four years, I've been leading the development of the open banking standard for the OBIE in, in the UK. Uh, I also um, CEO and co-founder of Ozone, which is a, a fintech that provides API technology for banks to help banks deliver great open banking APIs. So I have a, a very good understanding of um, what the standards are supposed to enable, how they're supposed to work, and, and how banks across uh, the, the UK and, in fact, Europe and globally now are, are how banks are implementing APIs, but also have quite a lot of insider knowledge of the, of the underlying API platforms and technologies and, and, and what can actually make this really work. So what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit, just a very brief introduction and recap. Uh, talks a little bit about myself, but I'll give a tiny introduction on uh, as to who the OBIE are. Um, I'm going to talk through uh, the uh, some example use cases, talk a little bit about the UK ecosystem, talk about also what's next and what's missing, um, and then hopefully leave some time for questions. So the OBIE, that's short for the Open Banking Implementation Entity. Uh, we sort of sit in the middle of uh, the, the regulators at the top in the UK, so the Competition and Markets Authority, FCA, and Treasury. We were set up by the FCA back in, uh, sorry, by the CMA back in 2016. Um, and we were initially tasked with creating a, an open banking standard for the CMA 9, as they're called, which is this collection of uh, fairly well known uh, financial institutions at the bottom. So the, the uh, initial scope of our work was to develop standards for the CMA9 for open banking, but since then it's become much more of a kind of market initiative. We've developed a, a PSD2 standard, a whole load of infrastructure and some supporting services to help both banks and third parties um, uh, adopt open banking. So um, a, a key thing, I'm not going to focus too much on the story about how we developed the standard, but it's been a very collaborative effort. We've uh, and we're continuing to develop and in, 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 uh, iterate the standard so that the standard can enable more use cases, whether they are regulatory requirements or commercial uh, or premium APIs, if you like. Um, but that's been our prime role is, is, is uh, to start with, was developing these standards. Um, and we hit quite a, quite a big milestone um, uh, a couple of months ago where in the UK, across the CMA9, so this isn't all of the banks in the UK, but across the CMA9, we now have well over 2 million customers using open banking. Uh, those are personal and business customers using open banking-enabled services. So obviously, there's still a lot more people than that in the UK, um, but it's a very good start. We're really starting to get traction in terms of this is a real thing now that offers real benefit to end customers. So. Um, a little bit more about the UK ecosystem. As of last month, we had uh, somewhere in the region of 77 banks, ASPSPs as they're called in Europe, uh, enrolled on the directory. Those are banks enrolled with OBIE uh, who are largely uh, following and, and building APIs in accordance with the, the standard that we've developed. We've got um, several hundred third parties that's split between AISPs, PISPs, and a few of these chaps called CBPIIs. I'm not going to go into the detail of that now. There are different types of regulated entity in, uh, in, 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 in PSD2 language. Um, but what's interesting is that we've got more than uh, the same again, in fact, almost twice that uh, uh, of firms who are still in the sandbox. What that means is that they have registered their intent to provide API enabled services or open banking enabled services, but they haven't yet got their regulatory authorization. They're not yet live. Um, and uh, those, those 2 million customers account have accounted for over 5 billion API calls to date across the CMA9. 
So as I said, this is a real thing. It's growing significantly. Um, and the the number of uh, firms in the sandbox gives you some idea of where you know where there's there's still a lot a, a lot more to go. So what 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 are these uh, what are these applications that are out there? These open banking applications doing well. Here are just some of the the sort of use cases that we're seeing. We're seeing examples of personal finance personal finance managers. The first uh, the first uh, proposition to go live in the UK was uh, something called Yolt, which is a uh, subsidiary or, or, or product that's owned by ING Bank in the Netherlands, and they were the first uh, third-party application to go live. It's a personal finance manager uh, based on open banking. But obviously, we've seen uh, business accounting packages have, have, have been uh, largely uh, um, the, 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 the beneficiaries of, of this. They've moved pretty much all of their connections from screen scraping and proprietary API feeds to open banking. Um, and that's accounted for a large element of the of the growth that I've mentioned there in terms of volume of API traffic. So all the cloud accounting packages are very active in in in, in this space. We're seeing some really interesting uh, use cases around unbundling overdrafts. So so applications that monitor your um, bank balance, your bank transactions, and can draw down on a short term loan, repay it when you've got money back in your account. That stops you going into overdraft, stops unauthorized overdraft, saves saves a huge amount of money. Uh, better lending, open banking is really powering, and particularly in the, in, the, in the current COVID crisis, has really helped um, firms offer loans more responsibly, more quickly to to, to customers. Um, and what's interesting now is we're starting to see a growth in payment APIs. So all of this growth initially, up until the certainly. Uh, last year was around the account information. What we're starting to see is is uh, payments and e-commerce starting to be enabled. Um, and there are some really interesting use cases around things like just basic stuff like paying your tax, paying your uh, paying suppliers, your, your payroll, etc. These sort of use cases where an open banking API uh, can be a much better alternative than, um, for example, uh, entering stuff manually in a in a banking app where you might put a reference number in wrong or uh, pay the wrong person. So, open banking APIs are, are really starting to 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 take off in payments, but it's very early days there in terms of the overall volumes. Um, I'm going to show you an example here. This is um, how. What's quite interesting about this example? This is I'm using QuickBooks, which is a cloud accounting package, and I'm going to connect it to Tide, which is a challenger bank. Um, what's interesting here is that the accounting package is on the desktop, Tide is a mobile only proposition. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect my bank account, choose Tide, I then get redirected to a little QR code. What you won't see in the background is I'm scanning the QR code in using my mobile phone to authenticate, but you'll see, you'll get the idea of how, how this works now. So I click to connect my bank account, I type Tide in, I select uh, the bank, I'm still in QuickBooks. I click continue, and what 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 uh, what I do is I give consent to connect to Tide. I get a little. So what Tide do is present a QR code to to me, the customer. I scan it in. I authentic. I've authenticated now. Um, I choose um, what account I'm connected to in QuickBooks, and QuickBooks is now connected to my Tide account. You see, that took less than a minute to connect my my bank account and for QuickBooks to have full access to my bank account. Um, a very seamless user experience, no usernames and passwords, all your passwords were harmed in the making of this video. Um, so you'll see how that's a, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great example of how an account information API works. Um, uh, the Tide, which I should have mentioned, they're one of Ozone's, Ozone's clients. Uh, we, we, we provide their API for them. I'm gonna show you another example. This is a payment example here where I'm going to uh, pay. In this case, this was uh, uh, an example that Just Giving launched with Captain Tor, uh, Tom Moore um, earlier this year to donate money to the NHS. Um, and one of the available options, which is a new option for Just Giving, is to use a bank transfer. This is an open banking payment. This, this, this is provided by American Express, who are, in this case, acting as a PISP to uh, facilitate the payments from my bank account into just giving so you'll see here i click on uh pay by bank transfer choose how much money i'm going to pay 30 pounds 
I uh, agree to pay using uh, my bank. I click on Monzo in this case. I'm presented in Monzo with a, 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 a authentication. I authenticate in Monzo. I click continue and I'm done. I'm redirected back to the American Express app, which when I click OK or done, that's the payments now being made from Monzo to Just Giving via this American Express app who's acting as a, as a PISP. Again, no usernames or passwords harmed in the making of this video. So you can see it's a great user experience, very secure. I'm using my biometrics and a, and a step up pin to authenticate to make the payment. So what have we seen in terms of API performance? So my caveat here is that this isn't all the banks in, in, in the UK or Europe for that matter. This is just the API, the CMA9. What we've seen here, as I, I mentioned, this growth in API traffic to uh, uh, over the course of the last couple of years now, 5 billion API calls. And you'll see it started growing exponentially up until sort of uh, probably February, March time. Uh, it flattened off a little bit, uh, no doubt to do with the COVID, COVID crisis and the fact that by March, pretty much all of the large cloud accounting packages had migrated. But what we're now seeing is a second growth and that's uh, a number of the other use cases that I uh, explained uh, or demonstrated. Um, so what's interesting is when we also look at the, across the CMA9, uh, there's been a ongoing continual improvement in the API performance, the response time. So on average, this has gone from uh, at the early days, June, July, two years ago, um, the uh, API response time was uh, not not great for an API. You know, it's nearly nearly three seconds per API call. Um, so it's kind of round about half a second on average across the the large banks. Um, excuse me. Um, what hasn't been so great, perhaps, is the availability. We've seen the CMA nine particularly uh, not struggle to to provide a hundred percent availability. I think there's an expectation in in in, in Techland that uh, API should be 100% available. Uh, some banks are, some of the CMA9 are, and many of the challenge banks are pretty much 100% available. But this is this is a challenge, and I think that's partly because big banks have got very complex legacy estate uh, estates. This is not something where the API is a, a gateway on its own right that just sits there and in the cloud and can always be available. It quite often links into legacy systems that aren't themselves 100% available. Um, and that's an interesting kind of uh, conundrum that the industry has to work out. Uh, and maybe, just maybe, this will fuel a move from uh, away from legacy uh, technology, uh, a move towards more modern digital technologies and uh, 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 big big banks hopefully embracing the cloud more. Um, what's also interesting is if you look at the comparison between uh, other banks, not just the CMA9, you won't be able to read all of this, but uh, the uh, the link is in the bottom there. So Yappily are an authorized third party. They provide a very useful little scorecard called apiscore.yappily.com. And what it shows you is there is very significant differences between some of the some of the banks in terms of the API performance and availability. You'll see the challenger banks here, Revolut, Monzo, Tide, uh, got much better overall performance than, uh, than 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 some of the larger banks, and consistently pretty much 100% availability. Um, and I think you know for the reasons I just stated that that may be because these challenger banks are pretty much cloud cloud first and. Uh, and they've got less complex uh, legacy estate. So what's next? Um, this was published back in May. This is something that is called the CMA Order Roadmap. So this is what OBIE is busy working on at the moment. And I've 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 grayed out large chunks. Of it. There's an awful lot of stuff still going on to look at continual ongoing improvements, additional functionality, uh, improvements in customer experience across across the banks. And so the standard is continually evolving. But the two things I would like to highlight here are there are two roadmap items, as they're called, um, that are uh, being consulted on imminently. So these are very significant uh, new things for the ecosystem. We've got something called variable recurring payments, which um, replicates the concept of long-lived consent that you have with account information. It replicates that for payment initiation. Um, and so this can enable payments to be made on um, uh, an ongoing basis without perhaps the uh, the customer having to authenticate with the bank every single payment. 
Um, so this is something that's been looked at in terms of a standard, not as something in, it, in its own right that would be mandated, but something that's a standard that could be implemented on an optional basis. And then in parallel with that, there is a sweeping evaluation. This is looking at sweeping, which is a movement of money between accounts in the name of the uh, customer's own uh, accounts, uh, is the kind of very high level definition. But sweeping is um, something that there's an evaluation as to whether or not sweeping can be delivered effectively without the RP compared to other payment methods for enabling sweeping payments, such as direct debits or, or uh, continuous payment authority or cards on file. So this is ongoing. I'm not going to talk about this in any detail other than to say there's a consultation that is starting imminently. I will leave my email address, both of them actually, at the, at the end. Please, if you do want to be involved in this, reach out to me and I can uh, make sure that you are aware of the consultation. It's a very open and collaborative effort to consult on these two items and we really welcome uh, uh, feedback from everyone in, in, in the industry. So this is interesting. Uh, on top of what we've been talking about, um, there are a number of things that are missing, according to a number of people, including something called the TPP Council, which is an EU-wide consortium, if you like. So these, these are just some of the things. The first is enforcement of existing PSD2 legislation. I think in the UK, we, 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 we through the OBIE, we've uh, done a pretty good job of, of getting APIs to a level which is, you know, along, uh, along the lines of what is expected and required under PSD2. There are, there are a number of uh, um, ongoing concerns across Europe that maybe some, 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 some of the other banks in Europe uh, aren't properly implementing PSD2. Um, and I think that's one of the asks to at least get to that first base and get, get PSD2 implemented properly and consistently. Um, linked to that is conformance and performance testing. It is something that we have been doing a lot of work on in the UK. Again, if you want to find out more, please do reach out to me. There's been a huge amount of effort in the UK. Both the OBIE and the OpenID Foundation have been working very collaboratively together to help um, develop conformance tools and put in place a certification um, program so that banks can certify and prove that they've implemented the standard correctly. And as you've seen, we, we put a lot of effort into measuring overall performance as well. I think production testing is, is an interesting one. You know, there's a, there's a kind of um, uh, a sort of view that many of the banks don't fully test stuff before it goes live and the testing happens in production. I think also third parties are inherently testing stuff in a production environment. It is quite difficult to test these complex APIs end to end in a sandbox. Not impossible at all, but but it, you know, a lot of testing happens in production and that's maybe a concern as well. Um, I think there is a, a, a thought about service level agreements, et cetera, or redundancy. You know, th this needs to be 100% available if you really want this to work in payments. And that's, that's certainly, uh, so, so, certainly an issue. And there are a number of other concerns of, of stuff that's missing in, in terms of the regulations. Um, one, one thing that uh, I think is absolutely key as well is identity in this. So with open banking, what, what we have um, access to in most cases is a reasonably highly assured identity and a method of authentication because customers have got, uh, specifically under PSD2, the, the requirement for strong customer authentication, customers you know, use pretty good uh, the authentication and security to, to get access to their bank accounts now. That digital identity and the authentication method is, is valuable. It doesn't exist uh, so consistently in other uh, financial service products outside of PSC2, and it certainly doesn't exist in many other non-financial areas in to, to the same degree. So um, I think there is a there is a certain value that uh, that many of the banks are looking at now in terms of how this can be used, leveraged if if if, if they've got the kind of underlying uh, API platforms in place and authentication in, in place. How can that be used to, for example, provide additional attributes that can validate a customer's identity for use cases like onboarding, something I've called PISP Plus here. So as well as providing a payment service. They could provide additional data to a PISP for a merchant payment, to example, for example, to prove age or address, et cetera. This is a, of, of a lot of interest because a, a PISP payment could become a lot more powerful if it could also validate uh, a, an address or an age. Uh, could help with a lot of reducing a lot of fraud and creating even better customer experience. 
I think there's a wider thing about how this bank ID concept could could be enabled on top of open banking. And ultimately, everyone's talking about open finance. And I haven't spoken too much about that. It's not necessarily a real thing just yet in the UK. It's something that this, the FCA are doing an open consultation on. Um, but effectively, access to, to non-PSD2 accounts, I think identity and particularly sort of bank ID type uh, um, services could really help unlock and enable open finance. So lastly, I just want to finish off on this. I think what's been interesting is we've seen a shift in mindset. So where banks uh, and the industry started uh, three, three, three or four years ago is really a compliance exercise. Certainly it felt like that in, in many cases. As we're now starting to look at adoption, um, and, and, and I've showed you some of the figures there now, and as this grows, we start to now look at commercialization. And I think the mindset in the industry is really shifting to, okay, we've built all of this stuff. How can we use it to drive commercial benefit um, as well as uh, obviously end customer benefit? So I think we're at a really interesting uh, phase, but um, as, as, as we mentioned right at the start of this, I think you know having really great APIs out there is absolutely key because you won't get the adoption and you certainly won't get the commercialization if, if your APIs aren't available high performance, et cetera. So that was it from me. Um, I'm just gonna leave my two email addresses uh, here. Um, so you can either contact me at Ozone or Open Banking. Certainly would welcome any uh, other questions now, but also if you wanna reach out about the consultation we're running on VRP and sweeping, certainly we'd, we'd love to have you involved. I'm gonna yeah, Chris. my slide. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. Uh, two two quick question. Uh, the fact that the standard has been a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, like defined compared to other regulation, do you see it as a best way to for the UK ecosystem to make greater APIs? Sorry, I, I didn't quite understand. You, can you say no. that one more time? So I, I said the fact that the policymakers actually pushed uh, a standard right into open banking APIs. Did yeah. it help? Uh, let's say a mindset of building greater APIs because at least some, you know, uh, there there was a way for banks to uh, to uh, yeah. and the standard to follow, and so everybody embraced, you know, the idea of good design. Yeah, I think having a standard uh, is absolutely essential, and having a fairly tightly defined standard is essential. I think there's a difference between the standard being so tightly defined that it's a constraint um, versus the standard being tightly defined, but enabling lots of different use cases, more than just the regulatory ones. But I think it's important that everyone follows the same standard. Um, certainly there are different standards across Europe and different standards emerging globally. Um, but I think ultimately what I, I'm very keen to see is that there's a convergence of those standards that they, where they are different, they're different for a very good reason, and we don't go and reinvent the wheel in different markets. But it is it is essential for banks to follow standards. If they don't follow standards, it's really difficult. Even when they do follow standards, if they don't follow them well, then it's difficult for uh, for, for third parties to build services on top. So two million users are actually benefiting from, benefiting directly from open banking uh, uh, in UK. Uh, uh, what's what's the main challenge for uh, the next two millions? <laughs> Well, I think payments is a is, is a big one. Um, and so looking at um, use cases, what, what, what we're starting to see now is, is some of the payment use cases come, coming to the fore. I think there are some obvious ones where the proxy or an open banking payment is a proxy or an alternative for a credit transfer. So I mentioned some of those like tax payments, payroll, you know, supplier payments, those sorts of things for businesses and individuals as well. Uh, government payments, I think, is a big one. All of, all of those use cases where you as a customer go into your banking app to make a payment, doing it via a, a payment API, I think, in many cases, a better customer experience and um, offers uh, better value for uh, uh, the, the recipients in terms of they get better quality data, better conversion rates, et cetera. So, um, less less can go wrong. So I think that's going to be the next the next growth in 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 my view. But also we're seeing a number of quite innovative um, use cases. And I think the the real key is when, as I mentioned on on the last slide, when banks start to look at this as a commercial opportunity, the API channel being an important channel for customer acquisition, growth, retention, etc. By partnering with fintechs to offer services rather than competing with them 
I think gets really interesting because if banks look at this as a commercial opportunity, then I think we'll get a lot more growth as well. So cooperation compared to competition to enlarge the market. Thank you very much, Chris.